Welcome, I'm Tracy Smith, and this is Here Comes the Sun, a closer look at some of the people, places, and things we bring you every weekend on Sunday morning. Vermont Democratic Senator Patrick Leahy is retiring at the end of this term after 48 years in office. He took a look back with our Robert Costa. You're elected in 1974, a Watergate baby. Now you're about to leave the Senate after an attack on the U.S. Capitol. What does that say to you? Part of it says to me, have we learned something? Does anybody read a book on history? January 6th shook me to the core because I thought back to the really wonderful men and women I've served with over, over all these years in both parties who would not have stood for this. There's more from their conversation coming up a little later in the show. There's a phrase you use throughout your book, senators with a capital S. <laughs> yes. What do you mean by that? I remember a couple of the old senators, or well, old they seemed to be at that time. They'd been here forever. Some were conservative. And they'd refer to senators. Say, well, he's a senator. And then he's a senator. I remember John Stennis and Hubert Humphrey. Stennis when Hubert Humphrey was dying, made it possible for him not to have to come back for a closed vote. When I thanked him for doing that, he said, but he's a senator. And I've never forgotten, I've never forgotten that. Then, with new collaborators like Dior and Manolo Blahnik, Seth Doan takes a look at the surprising renaissance of Birkenstocks. You're sitting at your desk, listening at times blasting music. Yeah. It's not what you expect from a CEO. Probably I'm not the average CEO. I never tried to be average in anything. And Birkenstock has proved it's not average either. If you haven't noticed, Birkenstocks are everywhere, revealing the toes or, yes, socks of not just the most unfashionable among us, but models and celebrities too. It's undeniable that Birkenstock is having a moment nearly 250 years in the making. That's all coming up right here on Here Comes the Sun. He's the fourth longest serving senator in U.S. history, a Batman buff, and you might say a bit of a crusader himself. Robert Costa sat down with Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont to talk about his new book and the final chapter of his career. There's an inscription on the side of the Dirksen Senate office building, and it reads, the Senate is the living symbol of our union of states. Is it? The Senate should be the conscience of the nation. Is the Senate failing now? The Senate has become so bitterly divided on things that they shouldn't be divided on. So all senators now rise and raise their right hand. Political divisions are the bookends to the long career of Vermont Democratic Senator Patrick Leahy. This is not the swamp. I think this is where democracy can be and should be. Now 82 and retiring at the end of this term, Leahy was sent to Washington in the wake of Watergate, an idealistic 34-year-old prosecutor. You're elected in 1974, a Watergate baby. Now you're about to leave the Senate after an attack on the U.S. Capitol. What does that say to you? Part of it says to me, have we learned something? Does anybody read a book on history? January 6th shook me to the core because I thought back to the really wonderful men and women I've served with over, over all these years in both parties who would not have stood for this. For his new memoir, published by Simon & Schuster, part of CBS parent company Paramount Global, Leahy plays off the title of the Robert Frost poem, The Road Not Taken. Indeed, United States Senator was an unlikely career path for the young attorney. And when Leahy arrived in Congress, he intended to keep his head down. Not easy when you stand six foot two. You really wanted to blend into the background most of the time. Oh, I did. I sat in the, uh, the first caucus. I came in, I sat way in the, in the back row against the wall. The next thing I knew, Hubert Humphrey, Scoop Jackson, a couple other 
the very senior ones come and sit beside me. They said, boy, you learn fast. I said, what do you mean? Well, you sit here, so if it gets boring, you can sneak out and let everybody <laughs> see you. One, I'd like to have you read the report. Leahy's no-nonsense approach endeared him to the old lions of the Senate. But his quiet composure has long hidden a crusader's zeal. Last year, when Chief Justice John Roberts declined to preside over Donald Trump's second impeachment trial, Leahy took on the task. The nays are 43, and he is hereby acquitted of the charge in said article. What would it have meant for the country if more Republicans had voted to convict Trump in that trial? I think it would have helped the country. I don't say this was a partisan thing. It would have sent word to the country in the same way that Barry Goldwater and Hugh Scott told Richard Nixon, you've broken the law, it's time to go. I wish more had been one to stand up and say this was wrong. They'd say it privately or say it publicly. There's no place where the public and private sides of politics come together more than in rooms like this. Leahy's so-called hideaway. Amid photos of his wife of 60 years, Marcel, and their family, it's where senators brokered an end to the 2019 government shutdown. I can just go ahead and take pictures. In and where Leahy can just line, be you know, himself. Just got him. I got your crew. In fact, I got No, that's enough. Right there, I got you. <laughs> Too close. Um, <laughs> Too close. An avid photographer, Leahy has lined the walls with photos of his home state. I was born basically blind in one eye. And things that require depth perception, like baseball and whatnot, are more difficult. You only need one eye for photography. The Vermont senator has another, far more unusual sideline. You remind me of my father. I hate him, my father. He's been a okay. bit player in several Batman movies. A lifelong fan of the Cape Crusader, Leahy has spent his career working for Americans with little power of their own. The poor, the hungry, children, and victims of landmines. Though he is the fourth longest serving senator in U.S. history, with the trappings of seniority to show for it, Leahy is the first of his family to have attended college. And he's not afraid to take the gloves off. He opposed all of Donald Trump's Supreme Court nominees. Trump claims he has an absolute right to pardon himself, does he? Taking particular umbrage during the Brett Kavanaugh hearings. Analyzed. There were a lot of people who should have been questioned in this last round by the FBI, but the uh, Trump White House said they couldn't. What do you make of Senator Collins and Senator Manchin saying Justice Kavanaugh misled them during the confirmation hearing? I was in that hearing. I wasn't misled. I believe the charges against him, and I believe that the White House stymied a full investigation. The FBI did not do a complete investigation. It was rushed through so you could not have a complete investigation. And it was a farce. But that's my view. The Biden years have proven happier for Leahy. And though he is only three years older than the president, he's not advising Biden to follow suit and retire. Should he run in 2024? That's going to have to be his decision. If he does, I'll support him. Because there is something about getting to a certain age where you start to maybe reflect about the crossroads of life. Really? <laughs> and when does that happen, Bob? You gotta, well, you tell me, sir. I got I to gotta read the book, The Road Taken. I got to find out when that, when that time is. Are you going to miss all of this? I'm going to miss this view. I've taken an awful lot of pictures. As Patrick Leahy prepares to descend from his position of power in Washington, his thoughts turn to the next generation of leaders and to the young man he once was. If you could go back to 1974 and tap the 34-year-old <laughs> you on the shoulder and give him a little advice, what would you tell him? I'd tell him things that look impossible aren't if you work hard enough at it. It's not going to be done with press releases and Look how great I am. It's going to be done with just steady, careful work. But it can be done. 
More exclusive excerpts from Robert Costa's chat with Patrick Leahy coming up a little later in the show. But up next, Birkenstocks are back. A glamorous twist is afoot in the fashion world. The once humble hippie staple, the Birkenstock, has turned trendy. Seth Doan got a glimpse inside their efforts to keep up with demand and quash counterfeiters. It's proof of popularity that the German footwear brand Birkenstock never wanted. Okay, what is the price for, for this? This is very cheap, very cheap. In the fight against fakes, the shoemaker has been sending teams of undercover investigators with hidden cameras into what they believe are counterfeiting factories. This is their video. In white and this is in black. Okay, Birkenstock. No problem. No problem. No problem. But it is a problem for Birkenstock. We don't just punish the marketplaces or the, the resellers. We really go to the factories. Birkenstock CEO Oliver Reichardt is aggressive. Turkey, Philippines, China, wherever. Sounds like you're running special ops. Yes, but that's necessary. His unconventional approach is clear at their Munich headquarters. You're sitting at your desk, listening, at times blasting music. Yeah. It's not what you expect from a CEO. Probably I'm not the average CEO. I never tried to be average in anything. And Birkenstock has proved it's not average either. If you haven't noticed, Birkenstocks are everywhere, revealing the toes or, yes, socks of not just the most unfashionable among us, but models and celebrities too. It's undeniable that Birkenstock is having a moment, nearly 250 years in the making. This is the perfect casual summertime shoe and everybody should own a pair. I hope you saved your Birkenstocks from eighth grade because they're back, baby. And I kid you not, these sandals have changed my life. And Birks have come a long way from their days as a hippie staple. Since he took over this formerly family-run business in 2009, Oliver Reichert has tried to inject a startup energy. If you have such a tradition and such a history, the threat is to wake up in your own museum. And I don't want to have this. In the footbed. He's ruthless regarding brand collaboration exactly. requests. They get plenty. Eight out of ten we say no. They said yes to Dior. How much is this? And are now producing this felt-covered shoe. Not enough, I would say. Retailing for over $1,000. It's about supporting the idea behind the product and not harming the DNA of either brand. It's like a marriage, you know. And there's luxury shoemaker Manolo Blahnik, known for his coveted stilettos. Manolo Blahnik. Manolo Blahnik. They weren't sandals, they were Manolos. But Blahnik is an avid Birkenstock customer, now turned collaborator. You think of Manolo Blahnik and Sex in the City and Sarah Jessica Parker. Yeah, yeah, but she's wearing Birkenstock as well, <laughs> uh, even in their private lives. No, I meant my stocks and socks. When you see some celebrity pictured with Birkenstocks, what do you think? I'm proud that they're wearing Birkenstocks, and I know, and this is, it makes me even prouder, they, they buy for it. You don't give them no, to some famous no, no. person? No, we don't have a Hollywood office or something like this, no, no. And if some celebrity says, hey, I'll, I'll wear this shoe, you won't send them a shoe? Why? Come on. If they send me money, I will send them a shoe. <laughs> if they buy the shoe? Yeah, of course. It's a glamorous twist for a company that traces its roots back to a cobbler in central Germany in 1774. In the late 1800s, a descendant, Conrad Birkenstock, began making and selling flexible insoles. For decades, that humble footbed was the family business. In the 60s, Karl Birkenstock was somehow frustrated that, okay, we make the best insole in the world, but nobody sees our product. So he decided to try to bring the footbed out of the shoes, and that's uh, the birthday of the, of the sandal. But the shoe stores in America didn't want the product. It was an ugly shoe. You know, they say, oh, okay, are you crazy? Ugly, perhaps, and for a time, uncool. But in just the past decade, Birkenstock reports sales have more than quadrupled. 
What's the most popular Birkenstock? Definitely the Arizona. This is the Arizona. I'll give you another nice picture. This is the Arizona. <laughs> you know? and, uh, and, then uh, COVID the provided spray. another unexpected Arizona's boost. Unfortunately, we became the number one home office shoe. The demand in the online was crazy. So why do you say unfortunately? It's painful to have no sales, but it's very painful to have too much sales. Trying to manage this global demand is challenging. We saw that at one of their factories in the east of Germany, where they were racing to fill a backlog of nearly a million pairs. How much stock is here? Yes, the stock only for 10 days. Managing director Hilmar Knoll juggles the logistics. We're always at the limit of our capacity. Daily, they produce 80,000 footbeds, which all start as a mix of cork from Portugal. This is part of the what you call secret recipe. Yes, this is one of our secrets, definitely. That secret mix is heated, then squeezed into molds. So this is jute, cork latex, jute, and the leather. Then will be this footbed. The shearling is one of our biggest success in the, in the last years. Birkenstock still makes all its shoes in Germany and is fiercely protective of that quality. As part of its effort to crack down on counterfeiters, it stopped selling on Amazon, citing the number of fakes being sold. How hard was that? For us, nothing. Well, it's a huge outlet. Maybe, but uh, not a good one. I think at the beginning, Amazon was a pioneer in online trading. You have to kill monsters when they are small. They're getting too big. You can't kill them, okay? They will eat you. And, uh, and we decide to kill our monsters early. In a statement, Amazon told us fewer than 0.01% of all products sold on Amazon received a counterfeit complaint from customers. And we won't rest until that number is zero. I mean, those are also very beautiful. The robust market for fakes reinforces, as if anyone needed a reminder, just how popular these sandals are, whatever the reason. Even the people who hate the brand wear them because they are good. It's like, you know, do you like taking medicine? No, yeah, it helps, so you swallow it. You seem almost proud that some people don't like your product. It's a proof of concept. It doesn't matter for us, because once you get the product, you will wear this, and you, and you, you really buy it. So, you know, one day we get you, so. I wish I had the optimism I had when I came here. More from Senator Patrick Leahy up next. Stay with us. Welcome back. As promised, here's more Robert Costa and Patrick Leahy. There's a phrase you use throughout your book, senators with a capital S. <laughs> yes. What do you mean by that? I remember a couple of the old senators, or well, old they seem to be at that time, they've been here forever, some were conservative, and they'd refer to senators. Say, well, he's a senator, and then he's a senator. And I remember one uh, Southern senator, very conservative, when he did it in all capital letters, he was talking about somebody who, who fit the image. Um, I remember John Stennis and Hubert Humphrey. Stennis, when Hubert Humphrey was dying, made it possible for him not to have to come back for a closed vote. When I thanked him for doing that, he said, but he's a senator. And I've never forgotten, I've never forgotten that. Are there senators left? There are, you know, I, I've served with over 400 senators. That's about a fifth of all the senators in the history of the country. <laughs> and some in both parties are people I admire so much. You write about how the Senate is having its problems. It has its struggles these days. You keep showing up. 82 years old, sometimes dealing with a health issue from time to time, you show up for votes. You're trying to make it work. Why? I believe in the Senate. I believe the Senate can represent the country. Remember, it's the United States Senate, and it's got to represent the whole country. And I, I want to try to do that. I want to do it by example. And uh, I will do that to the day I, I leave here. 
and I'll walk out proudly. I, that's why I, I went back to my notes over all these years and I wrote the book just to pick out different memories that might show that. Memories where I think we did everything right, memories where, where we did not do things right. I do wonder when you reflect on your whole career, and your book captures this, you've had a lot of wonderful experiences in your life, but you leave the Senate with fear about the future of the country, fear about the future of the Senate, fear about the future of the court, its integrity. It's pretty bleak. You know, I, I love the Senate. I love the fact that I've been able to be here. I feel honored that Vermonters who know me very, very well. I mean, I'm, when Marcel and I walk into a grocery store in Vermont, it's hi, Pat, hi, Marcel, where everybody knows us. And if they disagree with me, they tell me. If they agree with me, they tell me. So I, I feel honored to be here. And we made the decision over a year ago that this would be the last term. I wish I could be leaving the Senate with more optimism. I wish I had the optimism I had when I came here, when I saw us getting out of Watergate and senators in both parties coming together to try to make the country better. If we, if the Senate as a force is not the conscience of the nation, as it should be, if the Supreme Court loses credibility, if people break down into camps where they don't either read or even understand the Constitution or disregard it, then this country faces some real problems. I mean, we're the most diverse country, the most powerful nation on earth. One uh, province of my country that brought my grandparents from Italy uh, to the United States, my great-grandparents from Ireland to the United States, for hope and, and promise, and that's what most people do. I want that for my children and grandchildren, and I don't feel that same sense of optimism uh, that I had. That's why I'm hoping, I mean, I don't expect everybody to sit down and read every word of my book, but I hope enough people read it and see how it can be and how it should be and maybe inspired by that. I'm Tracy Smith. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you here next time on Here Comes the Sun.